Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, let me start by, by thanking uh, the organizers, especially Mantran, for having me here. I apologize this uh, as an additional talk, and I apologize this is perhaps slightly off topic. But, uh, well, let's just have some fun. Now, how do I advance? Oh, there we go. So, um, this is about the um, M theory and string theory of the 21st century. I, I, I need not emphasize that perhaps the thing of the 21st century is that this is a century of big data. And so it, it is well known that um, string theory has been very much a muse to pure mathematics, but perhaps what is less appreciated is that string theory has over the ages become um, also a benchmark for computational mathematics. So this is something that um, I have been involved with and also a bunch of various collaborations in, in, uh, with, with, with uh, you know, people like Macaulay or Gap or, or the Sage Project, um, they like us, uh, they like string theories because the kind of problem we give them are, are, are hard in the, in the computational complexity sense. Uh, so a, a, a lot of um, algebraic geometry, computational algebraic geometry problems are um, well benchmarked by the kind of problems that arise in string theory. So the plan of this talk is that I'm gonna use, you know, Clabiel geometry in, in particular is a very classical topic as a testing ground to uh, recent advances in data science. So this is kind of interesting because, you know, these days, most of our um, postdocs and graduate students, um, during the course of their PhD, they are learning machine learning and then they go off to work for a bank. Mm -hmm. So I've learned trying to do the other way and trying to learn this from them to try to take it back into our field. So this is actually a burgeoning enterprise, um, which really just started in the uh, last year. And so, by the way, I was, um, it'll be mainly, I'll mainly be talking about uh, this paper I read last year, and then some follow-ups in, in this direction. But it's kind of interesting that it, it really took off in the last year or so. Um, it's interesting, you know, strings, the annual strings conference started in 1986. In 2000, I think 96, maybe, 86, 85? Yeah, and in 2000, there was a branch of, uh, a two branch of strings conferences, string phenol and string math. So in one more decade, there's net one further branch of thing called string data. So the conference is actually string underscore data slash Python. And uh, right now there is one in, uh, there is one that's happening right now in Trieste, um, and it's called string intersect machine learning. So it's kind of, unfortunately, I can't be at that one. But it's interesting. So there are very, there's, there's a very, various collaborations and groups have been s involved in, in, in this, you know, sort of the string data aspects of, um, of, of, of this field. Now, every time I, I, I was told that if you ever talk about big data, you need to quote Professor Arili. I'll let you read about it. It's a, a fantastic quote. And I'll tell you about some of the uh, things that you need to be careful about as you go along. So our story begins with 1984, uh, with, of course, the discovery of the hydraulic string, and the subsequent beautiful paper here, which started this concept of string phenomenology, that, that string theory is not just a unified theory of gravity with quantum mechanics, but it's also a, um, a, a, a realistic theory, a potentially realistic theory, which could incorporate the standard model. In particular, um, the E8 group, the gauge group E8, um, contains the standard model. So this was the key point. So it was realized in this paper, so this really started this whole subject, that if you take E8 and you take the SU3 structure, which comes for free from a tangent bond on a, on a Calabria threefold, the commutant is E6, and this gave naturally to n equal to one supersymmetric E6 gut theory in four dimension, and from which you can then get the standard model. So this is, um, that's the basic setup of this paper. Um, the beautiful thing about this is that there's natural gauge unification in the setup. So this is sort of heterotic phenomenology. And the other beautiful thing is that everything, there's a, there's a very concise dictionary, so we can read about this in Green, Green Witten, Schwartz's book, that everything here is in particle physics and everything here is in algebraic geometry. All of the problems here, translate to a precise problem in algebraic geometry. Just to give a, an example, the, the net number of generations of particles in this is just the difference of the Hodge numbers, which is a half of the Euler characteristic. And indeed, um, this was believed 
to be the theory of everything. And so the, the problem then for string phenomenology in the 1980s was if you could find a compact smooth clavier threefold whose Euler character is plus minus six, then you have an answer to the real world. Right, so people like Brian Greene, Graham Ross, and Jacques uh, really started to, to, to look for this problem. And so, well, at this, at this point, you know, this is what Philip Candelas says, you, you, you go to a card-carrying algebraic geometer. Right? I'm not sure what the card refers to, but you go to the card-referring, card-carrying algebraic geometer and ask him or her what or is a compact smooth Calabria threefold with Euler character plus minus six. So, Immediately, I mean, of course, the card carrying algebraic geometer they went to was Yao himself. Interestingly, uh, Yao's proof of the Calabi conjecture was um, around about the same time. So there was just two branches of mathematics and physics that sort of met just at around, around about the same year. So uh, immediately, Yao gave them, gave them this, this one, the, the, the quintic, so the, 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 the degree, homogeneous degree five in CP4. And then you can, you can very easily compute that its quote Euler character is minus 200. A minus 200 is very far from plus minus 6. So, Philip and friends started this entire program for about five years to try to generalize the quintic, just because, you know, minus 200 wasn't good enough. You want plus minus 6. So, w what they did is, well, I mean, you, you take a degree 5 in CP4, you just generalize the ambient space of CP4 into a product of uh, CPNs. Right? And then you take multi-degree hypersurfaces, slice them out, such that it is a complete intersection, in the sense that the, the, the sum of this is three more than the number of defining equations. So you can write this in a very nice uh, configuration matrix, which is called a SISI, complete intersection clavier. Right? And then this is a five-year program just to try to study this. Just to give you some example of these uh, SISIs, um, the quintic itself can be written as five in four with uh, Euler character minus 200. And there are other things like the Tianyao manifold. You can check that one plus three is three plus one, and one plus three is three plus one, and three plus three minus three is three. And it, it turns out that every transpose of this is also a sissy. So this one I think Jacques loves very much. It's not in. And this one was, that was seriously taken to be the manifold in the 1980s, right? If you do phenomenology on this manifold, you tend to get six generation. This one didn't have Euler character minus six, but you had minus 18, which is three times six, and then you can quickly find a freely acting Z3 action, which quotients to what you want. And if you take its transpose, it's, it's actually uh, the, the doubly elliptically fibered Schoen manifold over P1. So these are nice examples. So here's a question. Uh, which these guys faced, um, classify these matrices. So, um, it was very quickly realized it was a very difficult problem. So they turned to the best computer at the time, namely the CERN supercomputer, and also, I think Shimmerick tells me, the, uh, the computer in UT Austin. There was some cluster in UT Austin. I mean, this is, I mean, this is 1980s, right? So this is really quite remarkable what they were doing. Uh, so, so things like punch cards were involved. If you go to Philip's office, um, magnetic tapes and dot matrix print. I mean, I've, the young people have no idea what I'm talking about. But, you know, in Philip's office, there's about a stack of this. The data is available in, in Philip's office. It's a stack about this large of, of dot matrix printout. It's a museum piece. Um, anyhow, if you do this, there are 7,800 such matrices ranging from 1 by 1 to about 12 by 15 with entries that range from 0 to 5. And you gave 266, 266 distinct Hodge pairs. Interestingly, you gave 670 distinct Euler numbers, all of which are negative. So this is the, the part thing you have to be, just because it's big data, Right, 7,000 by 1980s standards is big data, right? It's laughable by our standards today, but by then it's big data. Just because you have big data, it doesn't mean that it's not biased. And it, this happens to be the first data set in Clavier manifolds, happens to be a biased set. Uh, so of course, Philip knew this because Euler number going from minus to plus is mirror symmetry, and he knew about mirror symmetry, so you, 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 this can't possibly 
represent the typical set of claviales. Um, and more recently, Volker Brown did beautiful work in just classifying all freely acting symmetries, generalizing the sort of the Tianyao construction. So anyhow, um, so, so, so Philip and friends continued in the early 90s. So this is really, you know, it's a, it's a five-year program, uh, five years, uh, um, four to five year steps um, in just generalize it in some, some, some other way, maybe to make it more representative, more, less biased. So what they chose was, well, how else are you gonna generalize CPN? You weight it. So they considered single hypersurfaces in weighted CP4, um, and then you do this classification, there's 700, about, and, and also about 8,000 inequivalent uh, five factors. So this now gives about 3,000 Hodge pairs, and it's a much more balanced data set. Uh, just interestingly, minus plus minus 960 is the current best bound of Klabia. No, no construction in the last 40 years has ever produced a Klabia manifold with Euler number ever seen in these two range. They're just sort of on extreme ends. It might be a conjecture that this, this is the end. There's an old conjecture of Yao that the, uh, the homotopy types of Klabia threefolds is a finite number. This is quite interesting. So this is sort of part of the, the read fantasy of, of, the, of the space of Klaviyaus. Uh, it's still conjectural. Um, so, um, data science in mathematical physics might be earlier than you think. So this is from late 80s to early 90s, people were already data mining algebraic geometry. So I, I don't know whether Dave, Dave Berman is here, maybe he's asleep, oh, he's, he's escaped. I mean, he, he was talking about theology yesterday, this is a good quote for him. Uh, this is just something that's been running around in, on, on the internet. Um, so this continued, so late, um, early 90s, um, now we go to the mid 90s. Keep on generalizing, can you do better than this, right? And, and then this, this beautiful theorem of Batyrev and Borisov came along in 1994, which says that if you take a hypersurface in a toric variety constructed from a reflexive polytope, this hypersurface is Klabia. So this is a very nice theorem. So what's a, just briefly remind you what is, what is a reflexive polytope. This is just a lattice convex polytope with a single interior point. There are many equivalent definitions of this, but this is a very nice one. So in dimension two, you can just, you know, how many polygons can you draw uh, with a single interior point? I can draw like a square with a dot or, or um, uh, of course, define up to SL2Z, right? Everything here is SLNZ because it's a toric variety. So you can do uh, big triangles and a single interior point. The, the, the upshot is that whenever you have such a polytope, you construct a toric variety by constructing the, what's known as the, 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 um, the outer fan of this. And then this toric variety, as a compact toric variety, if you take its anti-canonical divisor, that hypersurface is Klabia. So that's this term. So in dimension two, this is classically known. I mean, this is known to you know, Del Pezzo and all these people I mean, 19th century Italian school. I mean, it's, it's not a hard problem. How many polygons can you draw with a single interior point? It turns out there are exactly 16 of this. And if you take the anti-canonical divisor of the toric variety in this, you get an elliptic, elliptic curve 16 very distinguished elliptic, elliptic curves, which are Klabia one-folds. That's, that's kind of interesting. In dimension two, this is already unknown. D forget it, we need dimension four, right? Because you, want a, uh, you, you need a compact toric variety of dimension four, possibly singular, and take its anti-canonical class, uh, anti-canonical divisor, and then that'll be Klabia. So again, this is a kind of problem that, uh, that's computational. Right? Pure mathematicians will never do this. This is embarrassing to them. So you, two physicists took the challenge. How do you classify polytopes in three dimensions and above, such that there's a single interior point up to SL2? This is, this is a problem you can explain to a high school student. So what they did, they took the best computer that was available to them, ran it on the next machine, ran it for, I believe, six month time computation. I mean, this is quite impressive for 1990s technology. And they found 4,319. So if you take the anti-canonical divisor in that, uh, you have K3 surfaces. Now here's a really nice one. The next number is four, 473 million. This is a beautiful sequence that goes as one, 16, 4,300, 473 million. So all of a sudden, the database 
of clavier manifolds went from 8,000, 10,000 to about a billion within the span of five years. That's kind of impressive. So last month, um, what, what's the next one? Just for fun, what's, what, what's the next number in the sequence? Uh, we don't know what it is, but they show that it's at least 185 billion. Now we're properly in data science, right? Because now by today's standards, these numbers are properly big data. And we're gonna mine all of this, right? If, if we're serious about mining the stream landscape, we have to try to do data science of sizes of this. All of this is downloadable. Uh, so this is, um, so, okay, I was joking a little earlier about Philip's office. That one um, is now online. There's mathematical formats for that. Um, this one is about six gigabytes. And we've been mining this with various collaborations. And there are interactive uh, online searches. So if you're bored tonight, you can't go to sleep, jet lagged. I highly encourage to go to this website, it's various websites, just Google it. And um, if you want to know whether there's a particular clavier manifold of H11 equal to 5, H22 equal to 300, uh, go up and look it up. It's kind of interesting. But within this data, this one, the 473 million, uh, this one produced about 30,000 distinct Hodge pairs, arranging again from, from this, this very curious number of 960. Um, mirror symmetry is actually very beautifully exhibited here by uh, duality of polytopes. That's, that's kind of a nice side, side effect. Um, so now here, so just to summarize about this compact Clavier three-fold three landscape, this is about 40 years of research by mathematicians, physicists, and now computer scientists. And it's about 500 million data points and growing. Um, Max Kreutz unfortunately passed away uh, during the course of, of, of doing this, and, and before, he, before he died, he gave us the, the double hypersurface in reflexive five, and that was two billion more data points, and that's not yet published, but that's, it's quite substantial. But if you plot them, um, so this, this has sort of become an iconic uh, picture in, in, this, in, in this business, uh, you plot the sum of H11 with H21 versus the difference. So this is the sum of the Hodge numbers versus the, diff the, 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 the Euler number. Right? Just, it's just sort of a rotated version, plotting H11 and H21. So why, why do you do this? It's because mirror symmetry is just says, it's a statement that every point here is at every point here. So this is, this is a very good experimental evidence for mirror symmetry. This is uh, uh, 473 million points, at least, uh, plus the two billion more that Marx had before he passed away. Um, and the, every point has, has its mirror pair. And the, the middle line is a self-mirror. Uh, my only contribution to this, to this diagram is uh, it's inspired by my four-year-old daughter, who is very good at coloring things in. So I colored this diagram in. So what is the color scheme here? Um, you note, note that it's 473 million points, but uh, only 30 distinct oil and, uh, oil and numbers, right? So there's huge multiplicity. So this is a plot of the a heat density, the log heat density, heat density of, of the multiplicity of how many are. So in a sense, most of these are, are concentrated somewhere over here. It's, 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 it's interesting that there are these two empty spaces that are completely empty. Nobody's ever found any clavias there. There's no reason why they should be there. Of course, the, I mean, this bound and this is that's just your defining of axis. But what, what are these? So Waddy Taylor has done some very beautiful work in showing that all of these things are elliptic vibration. But why? Nobody knows. And another thing, you know, if you run into a guy on the street who asks you, what is the most typical clavial? Your answer would be this one, the, 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 the very red region. It's the self-mirror 27, 27 manifold. Why? I don't know. 27 is 3 cubed. 3 is a trinity. You get very theological about this, right? You know, I'm, I get very mystical about this. Uh, but that is, so there's a million points just there. So there are a million of these reflexive polytopes in four dimensions, which produce 27,27 manifolds. Well, why? Uh, much more than, you know, there's like one here and one here. That's 960 minus 960. Yeah, that's a very good question. So this is, this is work in progress. Um, 
with, uh, let's see, so, so various combinations of these groups. Um, because the Hodge number is the first thing, then we need to check the second churn class, and then we need to get all the intersection numbers. So we need, we're in the process of mapping this um, as we go along. So we don't know yet. We've, map, we've mapped it up to um, H11 equal to eight, and then the, there's a group in Cornell that's mapping top down the big ones, hopefully we'll meet and, and, and just really check whether they're really topologically distinct. So d stay tuned. Um, just to give a Venn diagram of um, the sort of the, what we call the compact labial landscape. Um, you, you got the Kurtz of Chicago. I mean, this is, uh, there's no metric on this diagram. This is just randomly, this is just to show. So there, there's a lot of these. And that's the Sissy, uh, that's the Quintic, that's the Schoen. And the elliptic, this is a very interesting one. Uh, it is believed from the ex uh, experiments done by uh, Laura Anderson and James Gray and friends in, in, in Virginia Tech, that it is believed that something like 80% of all non-Clabia manifolds are elliptically fibered. That's sort of the number that I get from them. So it's kind of interesting that elliptic fibration tends to dominate over possible constructions. So, so that's, that's the compact story. Um, of course, um, you know, the, the, these days we don't do E6 anymore. At least I was told we don't do E6 anymore. Um, we can get more sophisticated. This is just a very brief, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, so, um, Wells, PMH Wilson in, in Cambridge and, and Shendroy in Oxford They'd also tried other embedding spaces like Grassmannians, and but they don't. These are these are card carrying algebraic geometers, right? So they haven't actually plotted any data. So it will be interesting to see. Uh, but one thing about the bias thing. So so when Marx did the double hypersurface in Toric five, um, um, nothing fell out of this diagram. So that's kind of first indication. This might be quite. Um, but of course, these, these days we do much more, right? I'm saying that it's much, much more than 500 million in this sense, because now, I mean, what, what, in terms of what is hydrotic phenomenology today, well, we, you know, we, don't, we don't do E6 anymore. We're really, we want to do SO10 or SU5 gut theories and then break it down by some Wilson line and then get SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. And again, this is completely phrasable. These whole problems can be completely phrasable into, into a problem in algebraic geometry. So what you do is take some stable holomorphic um, vector bundle, some po polystable holomorphic vector bundle of, uh, say, SUN or S, uh, N equal to 3, 4, 5, and then its commutant in its 6 will be, and then, then it's just group theory. So the, the, the point here is that now what we need to do is that we need to construct a Calabria manifold with a non-trivial pi 1, and then construct a pi 1 equivariant stable vector bundle, and then compute the bundle cohomology over this, so just generalizing the Hodge numbers. So this has been a, um, so you can, you know, everything in, in, in brown is physics, everything here is a precise problem in computational algebraic geometry. So, you know, you, you can, the Schoen gave us some very good results. And I guess people have been, you know, you can, you can do this by scanning, right? Because we have computer nets. Uh, you, you computer nets now. You can, you can construct these this bundles, compute their cohomology. It's very difficult computing this. I mean, we know exactly what to do. Um, you know, this, all of these are explicit algebraic varieties, right? So you can just write down some Euler sequence and then chase the, the Euler um, short exact sequence in long exact sequence in cohomology and then just do this. And if you do it by hand after a while, your hand gets tired, you use Macaulay 2 or Singular to try to make, it, make them do it. And then if you, that runs out, you recruit large parallel clusters of graduate students to do it. And then, but the problem with all of that is that these computations are um, exponential running time. The cohomology computations tends to be, so in, in a very precise sense, if, you, if, you ever, if I gave you a polynomial, the first thing, well, a system of polynomials, the first thing you want to do is to write that in a Grobner basis of a particular ordering, and then phrase the whole problem onto modules over, over this, and then compute its cohomology. That's exactly what Singular does. But Grobner basis computation is double exponential running time. So it's very expensive in that sense. So there's no way you can just scan through 500 million points in, in such a way, let alone put in vector bundles on 500 million points and scan through. 
So anyhow, um, but just to mention, um, th this work really culminated in, 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 this, in this series of, of, of works. Um, so what these guys did is to take just sums of line bundles. At least you can use C++ to just put the degrees in and compute its cohomology in sort of a semi-analytic way. So they scanned through this and they found about 200 in 10 to the 10 tend to have exact standard model things. So, in, so I want to emphasize what that means is that if you, if you randomly find a bundle over a random clavial and check its equivariant cohomology that has exactly three generations of particles, one pair of Higgs, et cetera, et cetera, the chances that you hit it is about one in a billion. That's something that's even remotely close to our universe. That's kind of nice result. This one in a billion is also very much in tune with Dieter Luce's work in type two, which is that they had this beautiful paper on one in a billion. That's the title of their paper. So it's kind of, it's, our universe is more rare than you think in, 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 this, in this way. Um, meanwhile, um, this whole program um, well, this was sort of resurrected in the, in the, in the 2000s, but um, around about mid-90s, this program sort of came to a stop. This, this old school came to a stop because of discovery of D-brains. But that opened up an entire new landscape of string phenomenology to do. Right? Now, all of a sudden, you don't have to do the traditional heroic string compactifier and clavier. Yeah? You can try to put a brain, you know, you can put your gauge theory on the brain and then, comp and then try to put probe non-compact clavier. And this grew further with, you know, M theory, G2, you know, F theory, and it, is, it, keep, it keeps on growing. But just to, to mention um, this bit, this, this, this deep brain perspective, um, this gives us sort of a landscape of non-compact clavias. Right, so that's something else you can also play, play with. So um, how do you, so part one, this is part two, is now would do the same thing about just give you a status report of what do we know about um, the non-compact landscape of clavias. So we have a challenge, which is some, something I've, 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 I've run into over the years, is how do you explain ADS-CFT to an algebraic geometer? Right. The compact one is very easy to explain. You can have some compact labial, compute this bundle cohomology, and that's, that's what you need to do. How do you, how do you explain the brain world scenario to an algebraic geometer? I find over the years the best way to do it is, is to phrase it in terms of uh, representation theory of curves. Right. So, this is, of course, a very, very tiny bit of ADA-CFT, but you know, algebraic geometers don't know what a correlation function is, so you need to explain what, what is ADA-CFT in this sense. So the, the, the basic upshot of ADA-CFT, the, the algebraic geometer's ADA-CFT, is the statement that the representation variety, or the, the King-Nakajima variety, of a particular representation of a quiver is the vacuum moduli space of a certain uh, a supersymmetric quantum field theory, and that mo vacuum moduli space is in, is in particular an affine Clavier variety. So just to give an example, if you take this quiver, this is a single noted quiver with three arrows, it's, it's labeled, so you can take n to be the label of the, of the node, so, so that the arrows become hom cn to cn, or n by n complex matrices. Let me just take n equal to one for simplicity, so x, y, z just are complex numbers. Right? And then you have some auxiliary function, you, uh, which is we call super, uh, actually algebraic geometers now call this thing the superpotential because of physicists. Um, representation theorists call this the superpotential. But uh, anyway, you take some auxiliary polynomial. If, 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 if x, y, z are um, complex numbers, I mean, th there's nothing here. So it's just a freely generated algebra on three uh, complex numbers, right? That's the algebra functions on C3. In other words, it's just the moduli space here is C3. Um, C3 is very nice because it's not just Ricci flat, it's completely flat. In fact, C3 is the simplest non-compact Clavier threefold. So that in, in this sense, um, our def, you know, is, is in this sense we define non-compact Clavier uh, threefold. But of course, to a physicist, this is not just any quiver, nor is this any random polynomial. This is what we call n equal to four Yamios theory. So in other words, this is Madesena's original story, 
that n equal to four Young Mills theory has its vacuum moduli space a caveat, which is C3. A C3 is very special because it's a Sasaki Einstein. It's trivially Sasaki Einstein in the sense it's cone over this Sasaki Einstein uh, manifold, which we call S5, and that's the S5 in 88s5 cross S5. So this is a very nice story to explain to, to, to algebraic geometers, right? So now, now just go play, right? Take random quivers, do their representation theory, find their moduli space, and check when, when the affine variety associated with this is some caveat. So you can do this. Um, you can take orbifolds. That's your first favorite thing. You know, you just, uh, if you take the orbifold theory of, of, of C3, you get um, some, uh, so here you just take some discrete finite subgroup of C3, and then you find its representation. Uh, the quiver here is actually just the generalization of the Mackay quiver, which is the SU2 case. Um, interestingly, um, since, since you know, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by classification problems, um, the discrete finite subgroup of SUN has been classified after n equal to 8. There's no reason to stop at 8, it's just I think people run out of energy. Uh, and then they always fall into this, of course, this is uh, the trivial case, and then some kind of a generalization of dihedral, and then some, some exceptional cases. And then you just go on, you know. Um, the biggest class of non-compact um, clavials uh, in this context, again, is coming from uh, torque varieties. So basically, the, the moral of the story is that whatever you do in your life, you always run into a torque variety. It, it is what it is. Uh, so here, uh, I won't get too much into this, but, but here, um, any lattice polygon, the cone over that is a uh, Calabia threefold, which is non-compact. So it's, 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 it's already you have an infinite number to play with. Um, so the school of Hanani has really studied all of this uh, very extensively, showing that there's a beautiful mapping um, between the, this kind of thing and, and, and the quiver representation of, of quivers which are dual to uh, bipartite graphs, to dimers. Um, anyhow, so just to summarize here, um, the setup here is you have these D brains or stacks of D brains um, probing a non-compact or affine clavia, which is itself a cone over some Sasaki Einstein 5 manifold. Right? So there's, that, there's this setup. And what do we know? What is this landscape here? Well, the, the, the most important point here is C3. It's the trivial clavia threefold. And then the other thing, the other favorite one is the conifold, which is the quadric hypersurface in C4. And you know, you can do quotienting, you can do uh, complex cones over del petzl surface, so the, anti, the total space of the anti-canonical uh, anti -canonical bundle over, over the base del petzls, and then there's an infinite number of these torque varieties, which you can do, and in the, there's a translation between here. Okay, so that's the state of the art of the last 40 years of sort of scanning through Clavier manifolds. So to summarize, um, there are growing databases and, and algorithms um, motivated by string theory, of course, to study these, uh, these geometries. And the archetypal problem that's involved in this, well, the first thing you want to do is to, whoops, to classify configurations. These configurations are typically integer matrices, right? For example, we saw that in the CC case, there were integer matrices, or um, if you want to do polytopes, you just have a matrix of, of list of the, in, of, the, of the vector, of the integer vectors of the, of the vertices of these polytopes. Uh, and then what you do uh, is, um, from this classification, you compute the, the geometrically relevant quantity, which is associated to the relevant physics. Um, in the toric case, you do some combinatorics. In, in orbifolds, you do some representation theory of finite groups. Uh, generically, of course, you, you're dealing with ideals in polynomial rings, and this is where you have to compute everything on the basis, and it's very, very expensive. Um, there are other things you can do, like numerical geometry, using methods like homotopy cont continuation. And then you compute, typically, you compute cohomology, which we know what to do. The methods are there, and they're all very, very expensive. But whatever it is, the typical problem in this setting is that you have some kind of integer tensor input, and you want an integer out of it. So this is 40 years of classifying 
and lots of work between mathematicians, physicists, and computer science, but at the end of the day, you want this kind of a structure of your problem. So, the good thing is, a lot of these have, are, are, I mean, most of these are actually online, freely available. Freely available. No, we're, we're not Stephen Wolfram, we make things free. Um, the thing, the generic computation is hard, so you naturally ask yourself a question, can we borrow the techniques from the big data revolution? So this is a wild question. Since, since this is the case, so I just asked myself, as I was learning AI for my um, PhD students and, and, and postdocs who promptly leave to work in finance, um, the question is, well, can uh, AI do better than we can do in terms of algebraic geometry? I know they already do better than us in finance, in stock market, and in, in the national health services, but can they do learn algebraic geometry? So experimentally, this seems to be the case in a lot of the problems that we do today. So um, now let's uh, switch to something completely different. So let's talk about hand re hand handwriting recognition. So I'm, I'm just going to do, this is how I write from 1 to 0. Um, it's going to be different from yours. Now I'm going to ask the question, how do I make the computer recognize these digits? Now, as mathematical physicists, we would do it the hardcore way, right? We set up an acute Morse function and try to check the critical points of what we call a number. Nine has one critical point here, one critical point, you know, you can, if, you can, if you're clever enough. But that's a very inefficient way of doing it. And there's also lots of variation. This kind of reminds me of exactly what we have been doing, which is to compute cohomology using standard methods of long exact sequences, which is expensive. Can we bypass that? Well, Google does. I mean, your iPhone does. So what does, iPhone, what does your iPhone do when it looks at this, this try to recognize, recognize this, this problem? Well, what it does is it takes a lot of sample and then associate in, with correct things, correct values, and then try to predict. It gets better and better and better every time you use your phone. So uh, there's the NIST database of handwritten digits. You can play with that. So different people write twos, but you know, it, the variation is not very, very much. It's a bit of it, but not very much. So here's a perfect problem for machine learning, for what we call supervised machine learning. So step number one, data acquisition. Two, you set up your favorite thing, for example, a neural network. And three, train your neural network to, to predict. So the question now is, because we've computed by brute force so many of these cases in the Clavier landscape, or the algebraic geometry landscape, we have databases of points that are on the order of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. Can we then set up a clever enough neural network who has absolutely no idea what algebraic geometry is, or who has no idea what quantum field theory is, but is, at the end of the day, can it start predicting the correct values? Right, so that's, that's the bottom line. So just to some, I guess this is some notational uh, to, issues about you know, what, what we're doing. Uh, I, I'm just sharing with you my ignorance. You know, I don't know anything about it. I'm learning this as I'm going along. Right? So I'm learning about, this is really a cool subject. Um, so what is a neuron? Right? So a neuron uh, has been called the perceptron. So th this whole business started in 1957. This is kind of cute. The first neural network was set up with uh, cadmium sulfide photocells in Cornell. And then people were shining torches on them to try to make them replicate the, the, the mind. Um, but for us, you know, a neuron is just some function, hopefully analytic function, and nonlinear. And then you take some tensor input for some multi-index. So this, this could be some very complicated tensor input. And you consider this with, with, with what's called weight and biases. And typically, you know, this function, this neuron function, is a, is a sigmoid or hyperbolic tangent or some other nonlinear function. And then you feed uh, training data into it, and then you, you simply minimize some cost function, for example, the standard deviation squared, and to, to optimize on these weights and biases which are built into, your, into this neuron. And then you use this to predict. Right. This, of course, is nothing but regression. This is just nonlinear regression. Um, 
Yeah, you know, but by the way, but I don't know, but this thing was called the perceptron. This single neuron was called perceptron. The fact that it's, that it ends in tron probably suggests that this is something that came out from the 50s and 60s. Nowadays, we would never call something like this. Um, but the, the magic comes in is when you set up a network of these, of these things. And now this is, the black, this is where the black box comes in. You, you hook up a whole bunch of these using very complicated network structure. Right, so all of these neuron talks, all these regressors talk to each other in very complicated ways. Now, so this thing, you know, if you have multiple layers of this, called, this is called the multi-layer perceptron. Um, the ones I'm gonna use is it's just a simple one. I mean, I didn't optimize on network structure, so I'm just gonna take a sigmoid fed into a linear and then I'm just gonna sum up because I'm taking some integer tensor input, I'm gonna pump out some, some integer. Um, the reason I got into this is because uh, um, Mathematic 11.1 came up, um, came out in 2017, uh, which has all of this built in. And you know, we, we're familiar with, with, with Mathematica, so it's kind of nice. Uh, you, you, can, you can just play with it. So, okay, so that was just my notational setting for, for neural networks. So now let's, let's, let's actually do experiment. So let's first take hypersurfaces in weighted, weighted CP4, so for example, I want a quick, quick estimate, right? Um, I know in this data set uh, that Philip and friends had back in the day, um, there's a huge variation in the actual Hodge numbers, right? Oh, by the way, computing Euler number is easy, right? Because this is an index. It's, it's just going to be some analytic uh, function of the input. But computing individual terms of cohomology is difficult. That's the difficult bit. So if I want to just ask a quick question, um, how, if you gave me a five vector, I have no idea what this five vector is, can the AI, based on the fact that it's seen some examples, start to quickly estimate whether H21 is big or small? Let's just ask this very, very primitive question. So, let's, so what do I mean by this? So if you look at this, this distribution, of, so that's, that's, this is 7, 5, this is um, the, the 7,555 uh, 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 hypersurface in weighted CP4. Um, each point, the input is just the integer five vector. Right? And the output is gonna be a yes, no query on whether H21 is bigger than 50, say, or less than 50. Right? So that's it. And if you just plot this, um, you know, sequentially what it is, there's no pattern. The, the human eye can't distinguish it. So the question is, can AI do better than this? So you, you feed it in, so I, I try it. You take a, a multi-layer perception on your network. In under one minute, it was able to decide up to 97% accuracy. That's pretty good, right? If I actually have to compute this, the H21, it, it would take days. Even, even on today's best computer, why? Because Grobner basis is expensive. But the fact, well, here, I, this was done, so I can actually validate my, my, my answer. And I know that this, that's where this, this accuracy. Just um, to give a, a little more, um, you, because this is a yes, no query, you need something else, um, because you, know, you, want, you want to minimize false, and me false positives or true negatives, right? So you need to compute what's known as a Matthews coefficient, which is essentially the square of the chi-square, a square root of the chi-square. So you want this coefficient to be, low, uh, to be close to one as well. So the point is, um, there is already something in, in, in the data science literature which, uh, which takes care of this kind of validation. It's just called cross-validation. So you have 7,555 points, you train Gamma percent, that's the scene. You gotta make sure you're not overfitting, right? You, you, you train it with some ga percentage, say gamma. Uh, once it's rigidized the, uh, the neural network, you predict what it should be for the one minus gamma percent, or 100 minus gamma percent. So to make sure you're not overfitting anything. So as you sweep up gamma, um, the, the, the accuracy measure that you're using uh, constitutes what's known as a training curve or learning curve. So if you look at the, learn, the, the learning curve here, that's kind of good. So at 20%, you're already up to 90% um, precision, that's the uh, percentage agreement, and you're up to 0 0.9 in your, in your chi-square confidence. 
And, and you can see this curve kind of start. I mean, of course, you'll never reach 100% because this is all very statistical. Um, so at 80%, you, you get up to about 90, 95% accuracy already. So this is quite interesting. So just, just to reiterate, your neural network has no idea what is mathematics. It has no idea what is string theory. All it knows is that it's seen that this five vector produces H21 is equal to seven. This five vector produces you know, six. This one is 50, blah, blah, blah. And it trains on this data set that is seen, say, 1,000 cases. You then to validate against the remaining 6,000 cases and just go up and up and, and, and so on. Which is kind of cool. This is, and, and it does this, it does under one minute. Right, as opposed to many hours, yeah. 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 Oh yeah, that, that could, that you, it could be, I, I, I don't know, yeah. Um, that, that's a good point, so with, with something we're trying, I think the Brand Nelson has also tried in D, which is to train only on small Hodge numbers and try to predict on high Hodge numbers, right? That's the kind of thing you wanna see. Um, but the thing is, we don't know a lot of the results for when it, when it gets, when H1 gets large. So we just have to base it on, if it starts to do very well, Hopefully it'll, do, it'll continue the trend. Uh, but of course, at, at some level, this is black box, right? And so, but I, I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice the, uh, you know, a computation which will take the age of the universe for a couple of, you know, couple of hour estimate on a, a possible answer. Because if you want to compute all cohomologies of all the bundles over all these claviales, and that will take many, many orders bigger than the age of the universe. But if you start estimating this, uh, it's actually very, very doable. In, in a matter of hours, you can start getting, some, getting an idea where you're going. So, and then the rest is prayer. I'm a religious man, you know, I, I, I have faith. <laughs> So you try, you mean try low and try predict high? Yeah, so good, so I'll get to that, yeah, so, right, so, yeah, so good, so, so I'm gonna do a little more experiment, so this is just a warm up experiment which you can do. So you can, you can get more sophisticated now. Um, so, take sissies. Right, so sissy, the input here is a 12 by 15 padded integer matrix with entries from zero to six. Right, that's, that's all this clavier is. And, and then what occurred to me, wait a minute, this is just a, a, a six colored pixelated image. That's kind of cool, right? I mean, this, I mean, this is sissy number, I don't know, 2752, which is, happens to be um, the complete intersection of seven whatever, multi-degree whatever in P1 cross whatever. But as far as the computer is concerned, it's just this image. So this is very much like, you know, the movie Matrix. You know, after, after a while, you just see like pictures. You don't, you don't worry about reality anymore. This is, this is, actually, this is actually some clavier variety. And then you train, you train your, your, your network to see whether, um, how, how this responds. So this is a bit slower, your, your input is more sophisticated. And again, you, you achieve quite, quite nice, um, in about five minutes, you can, you can achieve, again, this, this level of accuracy. Um, pardon? On oh, the validation data set, yeah. So you can see that the, the learning curves um, in the beginning, wasn't so good because it's I mean, there's a there's a big matrices. It gets a little confused about. I mean, the, 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 here is a, you got to make sure both of these are close to one. You can't just have you know random positive negatives. Uh, so around about thirty percent, it's it's getting very good for uh, prediction. So we're, we're right. In, so let, let me let me just tell you about about the. Uh, uh, so this is again an, an on-off prediction, but you can actually do much more sophisticated, which is uh, this thing. 
Um, so everything that I did so far was just me playing around with Mathematica. And then, of course, you know, you go to the, 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 the experts. Um, they tell you, you should, the, the proper way to do it is using, using TensorFlow or Keras, as I was talking to Christian about earlier. So at this point, you know, I'm, I'm no Python expert, but luckily my student Kieran uh, is. I mean, this is, he, he's fantastic. He really took the, uh, the torchbearer in, in, in this follow-up project. What he did, um, this guy eats, I believe, he eats 7,000 lines of Python for breakfast. And um, so he did a much more sophisticated thing, which is to actually predict the Hodge numbers. Right? If, you, if you look at the sissy list, it's 8,000 manifolds, around about 8,000 manifolds, and the the H11s are distributed from 0 to 19. And you want, so this is a 19 channel classifier, right? So uh, you can do it through a support vector machines or decision trees or, or neural network um, regressors or classifiers and experiment. And then he used a, a genetic algorithm to, to optimize on network structure. Ultimately, he found that the, the SVMs do best. I think, I, I think Amir loves SVMs. Um, uh, and, 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 and what you see here is um, the actual distribution of the Hodge, of, of H, the actual H11, to compute, compute the actual value of H11. Um, when you've, you, know, you sort of see the, as, as the data goes from up, upwards, if you see more and more data, it converges towards what you expect from the actual distribution of H11. So we, we're doing a follow-up right now, which is, to answer your question, what we're doing now is we're going to sort the H11s. So to make sure the neural network only sees low H11 and starts to predict the high H11. Because the more H11s, the, the more Kähler classes they are, the more computation, uh, more difficult the computation. So can you just by having learned uh, small, small H11s start to compute what it might be for high H11 ones. So, so far that's also behaving very well. So in some sense, it is surprising. Um, I mean, at some level, I have no idea what the neural network is doing. Right? But it's, it's, whatever it is doing, it's definitely not doing Grobner basis, which is what we are told to do. And whatever it's doing, is, it's not doing um, spectral sequences along the exact sequences in homology. Uh, so it's found some trick that we have yet to explore. It would be very, very nice to pinpoint exactly which neuron is doing what, take that out, and then go tell the card-carrying algebraic geometry proof that this kind of computation is better than spectral sequences. I don't know what it is yet, because there's so many. 97% of the time, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> which is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, if they, yeah. So, well, at some point, yeah, so I was, yeah, so, so I actually, I told, I, I was just, um, to, um, three weeks ago, I was giving this talk to, to Yao, and he hasn't eaten me alive. He didn't kill me. I told him I no longer see Cloud BR manifolds. All I see is just pixelated images. I thought at that point he would just. No, I, it was fine, <laughs> and, and he wasn't even offended by the fact that I said, you know, 97% of the time I can tell you better than cohomology. Well, he says, well, tell me exactly where, and, and tell me where it fails, and then give me what's the correct way to compute it. I, I, I have no idea. This is, this is a whole different level of knowledge of, of machine learning that I don't have yet. I'm, I'm, I'm learning at the time. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, experts definitely do this. I mean, there are a lot of the machine, learn, uh, machine learning community is about studying where it goes wrong, why it goes wrong, how to improve it. Absolutely. Uh, I, I don't know this literature well enough yet, but I'm, I'm hoping to learn more. So I'm learning, learning. Yeah. Um, so just, just to summarize, I don't want to keep you from, from, from your dinner. Um, at some level, what is it? I have no idea. And all I know is that we're not overfitted because we're doing this cross-validation. So then it occurred to me, well, I should check on something else, right? So at some level, algebraic geometry 
comes down to finding kernels and co-kernels of integer matrices. Almost every computation you will encounter in algebraic geometry comes down to that. Right? You know, you have some long exact sequence. In some monomial basis, this is some matrix. And then you're just finding co-kernels and kernels of these maps. So th this is exactly the kind of problems that, are good, that AI is good at. So let me try to break the system by trying to find something the AI should be bad at. Can I start predicting prime numbers? Right. So I tried. This is a very simple training neural network. Two input, three output. Two, three input, five output. Two, three, five goes to seven. Two, three, five, seven goes to 11. I trained it 100,000 points and then let the neural network to try to predict what the next number is. Right. Thank God it predicted a 0.1% accuracy. Basically, it's just randomly guessing. So this is good because if neural networks can start predicting prime numbers or, you know, or the next zero of the zeta function, this is crazy. So bottom line, algebraic geometry, good. Thank God our problems belong to the class of algebraic geometry, that you know, stream phenomenology belongs to the class that is good and well adapted to, to, to artificial intelligence, whereas problems in number theory are not. And, and we don't quite infringe upon number theory quite yet. Not, not that much, at least. So currently, I'm, I'm working with uh, um, Minyoung Kim on trying to see other possible structure. What other branch of mathematics is, responds well to, to, to artificial intelligence? So that's kind of an interesting problem to explore. So uh, just to summarize, um, so in, in physics, this is good because you know it's given us classifiers and predictors to, to this landscape of problems, which are much, much more efficient than if you want to do by brute force. In the mathematics, this is also quite interesting because we really want to know, as you say, what's happening and w why can I predict cohomology 97% of the time um, better than, than, than standard methods. Um, so to quote, to quote my, uh, my friend Boris Zilber, he's a, he's a professor of, of logic. He says, what you're doing is you've managed syntax without semantics, which I think is a wonderful way of summarizing whatever the hell I'm doing. Um, and a shameless advertisement. Um, there, will, there, 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 there will be a book on, on, on machine learning in the cloud landscape, which hopefully will come out next week, uh, so next year. And um, I think that's well. Interestingly, Sophia also came up came out around about 2017. Now, 2017 is a really golden age for for this sort of business. And uh, at some point, I'm hoping that we just give what we, we train Sophia to write and upload all our papers to archive without ever doing anything. So maybe that's the ultimate goal. So thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's their favorite thing. In fact, I was told, you know, you know, in 1957, this whole thing already started. Why is it that we're doing this now? Why is this evolution? I, I was told that what happened was in 2005, this guy, Alex, whatever, I forgot his name, came up with this thing called AlexNet, which was, is, a, is a pattern recognition problem. And what he did, he, he started um, setting up very nice algorithms, which tapped into the GPU of your computer. So, so the, the reason why this whole field of machine learning has taken off in the last five years is because you know, we have two CPUs, and CPUs they don't do very much. You know, all of this computation we've done so far, all the singular computation, Sage and whatnot on CPUs, but even your standard, your, your standard notebook, your, your um, uh, laptop, has about 1,000 GPUs, all of which specialize only in this problem of matrix transformation. Because it came out from the, the gaming industry. The graphic processing unit is just specifically there to like, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a gamer, but like to, to rotate and shoot things. So all of a sudden, all of your laptops are, are, are turned into huge multi-core uh, supercomputers for this specific kind of problems that translates matrices. So that's why the industry took off in the last five years. And so everybody's doing it. Uh, you, don't, you no longer need you know, the CERN supercomputer to do any of this stuff. Because if you think about what you're actually doing in terms of the, 
of, uh, of this optimization problem. It's huge. Um, because you know, the, the, the more the number of nodes, you can imagine you've got more number of parameters, and you solve a big, I mean, it's a simple, it's a simple, conceptually simple, but there are many, many partial derivatives, you've got to solve them. But they're bypassing that by using, by tapping into your GPU. And so somehow, this class of problems in algebraic geometry, which is about finding kernels and co-kernels of matrices, are perfectly adapted for your GPU. Thank you. Thank you.